Hi, I'm Samantha Hartley of Enlightened Marketing, and I want to welcome you to the Profitable Joyful Consulting Podcast. Today's episode is starting at the very center, the very most important uh, aspect of profitable and joyful businesses, and that is with perfect clients. The key to having a profitable and joyful business and the, the center, the very essence of profitable and joyful businesses is working exclusively and only with perfect clients. Now, it may seem that uh, <laughs> that this is an obvious thing, and in fact, uh, I refer back to this expression from the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident. For many people, it is self-evident that you need to work with perfect clients only. But uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about why we don't want to work with uh, what I call rotten clients. It's a you know, it's a humorous way to refer to something that doesn't always feel really good is when you're working with difficult clients or just those who aren't a fit for you. It's, you know, kind of rotten clients. Um, so I'm going to talk about why working with uh, rotten clients is so bad for your business. It's uh, actually not even worth a little bit of a compromise or a fudge to work with somebody who isn't a good fit. Um, I'm going to share with you why perfect clients are so profitable and joyful and actually just make plain business, good business sense. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can find those uh, perfect clients and, and knowing what that is for you. So that's what we're going to cover today. It's uh, some of the most uh, fundamental and perhaps basic, but uh, important ones that if you don't have this in place, it can be way too difficult for you to, to grow your business. So first, uh, a little story. I don't like to look back and look at painful things, but I do uh, thank so much. I'm very grateful to this client for being so difficult um, and showing me exactly what I needed to know about the kind of traps that I'm going to fall into. Many years ago, when I was a very young and junior consultant, I had a client who came to me. We did a small kind of um, a brainstorming project for her business, kind of when she was thinking about what business she wanted to be in. And then uh, she went away and came back, decided which of those businesses she wanted to grow. And she'd actually started it and wanted my help uh, with that business. And the problems from the very beginning were evident because um, when I would give her some specific uh, feedback about her business, um, she did, did not want to receive that feedback. So first of all, she uh, didn't take any of that in well. Um, then there were, in the business itself, with her and her team, there was a lot of uh, conflict and turbulence. Um, and in fact, uh, one day it uh, kind of um, peaked with a, a kind of a ridiculous and probably symbolic incident, which is that the toilets in her facility began overflowing. I just took that as a sign. Now, if I go back and I look at what was so specifically um, the thing that drew me in to work with her, even once I saw that she was not coachable, she wasn't interested in, um, in taking my advice, and she felt not only that my advice wasn't a fit for her, but it was actually pulling her off track, even though... Um, I had a lot of experience in growing her kind of business. The important thing was she would turn to me and ask me for help, and that would activate my problem solver, which is one of one of my best qualities when used in light, but she would activate my problem solver and uh, and then reject it. And so I would get stuck in this cycle because she doesn't want my advice, but she does want it. She does and she doesn't. Um, and one day I said uh, to my husband, I said, I, you know, I don't know what I'm supposed to do working with this woman because she keeps asking me for advice and then she won't take it. I was like, she keeps, you know, pushing my, um, my answers button um, and, uh, and, and yet not doing anything with it. And he said, sometimes the best way that you can help a client is maybe just to let her, you know, make the mistake. Um, do things her way so she knows, I mean, maybe they will work, but maybe they're not going to work. And the way he actually phrased it was, sometimes you just have to let them fly their plane into the side of the mountain. So that was very difficult for me because what I'm good at is solving problems and helping people avoid flying the plane into the side of the mountain. But what I needed to learn was I can't help everyone. And I tell you this story because I'm far, far from this now, but every day I speak with clients who have a rescuer complex, hero complex, uh, you know, the mighty mouse thing of here I come to save the day. Um, our, our clients who we, whom we want to help, we truly want to help them, um, they may not be at the stage of being able to receive that help. Now, she's a very specific example. I have another client. I call these my spiritual teachers, you know, the clients who have taught me the most important lessons along the way. There was another one who uh, was late for every meeting, was not prepared, was late with payments, um, 
you know, was uh, respected the work uh, theoretically, <laughs> but um, didn't actually, uh, you know, facilitate it or make anything easier. Um, and so that was a very difficult project to fulfill just because, um, you know, logistically, he just didn't have his act together. So it wasn't like I was being opposed in, in, as she was. Um, he just was, was terrible and I needed to um, develop and assert better boundaries. So if you think back to clients that you've had who were teaching you something, you know, the, the difficult clients that you've worked with, what were there, they there to teach you? And what are you doing differently in your business now due to them? So I'm so grateful to those clients. I'm really grateful that I had them very early in my co um, consulting career because I don't need to relearn those um, messages anymore, um, those lessons. And when I get into a situation where something is kind of reminding me that uh, somebody doesn't really actually want my advice, even though they seem to be sincerely asking for it, or that somebody is um, being uh, really bad with time boundaries or payments or things like that, uh, I can go, oh, okay, so I need to remind myself of this and kind of up my game again. So those are my personal stories. I'm sure you have your own stories. Hopefully they're, they're not too painful and they're very far in the past. But in, in general, I want you to always mind those for all the lessons you can take away from them. And I wanted to just summarize why rotten clients are so bad for our business. The thing is, if I think people feel like, well, they're, you know, they're emotionally bad or they, they feel bad to work with. It's not in joy, right? It's not a joyful thing to work with these kinds of rotten clients, but you know, I kind of need them to keep my business going. Well, the fact is they're not profitable. It's a bad business decision to work with a rotten client. If you think about the, the two that I just mentioned, super not profitable and not just because they weren't fun. So um, rotten clients, uh, they require more time and effort. Very often they're pulling you off of your, out of your zone of genius um, and out of the flow in order to work with them. So way more time and effort. Um, especially the ones that are, you know, showing up uh, late um, and unprepared. But very often they just, um, they just are not in the flow of what you're doing. And more time spent with clients very often is going to mean less profitability. Um, and, and that getting you out of your flow, it makes you way less profitable. Um, rotten clients push back on your prices and your value. They question your value. So, you know, that paying late, uh, paying late is a message. It's not, uh, it's someone being scatterbrained or forgetting about you. Paying late is almost always sending you a message, uh, that they're not, um, happy with the value. They're not sure about the value. And if you've ever, um, signed on a rotten client, you, if you look back at that process in the very beginning, you'll notice that there were probably some negotiations around price. Um, haggling, pushing back on, you know, finding kind of small things or big things uh, that they don't like about the price. So questioning your value in general is a quality of rotten clients, those who are just not a good fit for you. And I mean, I could go on and on and on with uh, ways that working with perfect, uh, rotten clients is bad for you. But the last one I'll just um, bring up is, sure, you can do um, a, sh a short term thing. You can do uh, some work with uh, a client who is not a perfect fit for you, knowing that they're not a perfect fit for you. But what happens? It means that sure you get paid for that, but you don't get any testimonials or referrals because you don't want a testimonial from someone who's not a fit for your brand. And when they refer you, very often they're referring you to people who are like them. And if they're like them, then they're also not a fit for your brand. So the, the referrals from imperfect clients are usually not perfect for you either. So it's a, um, to summarize this, uh, working with rotten clients, those who are just not a good fit for you, even a little bit not a fit for you, is uh, bad, is not joyful, and it's bad business because they're less profitable, and we know they're just not nearly as much fun. So I want you to keep that in mind going forward. And the one thing I will, I will just add here is as you grow as a brand and as a business owner and, and as you mature, you're going to find that your perfect clients also evolve. What makes a perfect client for you today will be, you'll look back and you'll be like, oh wow, I probably never work with them today. You're going to evolve and your clients will get ever more perfect. And as you're clearer on what you do and as you evolve in your own skills of what you do, the people who want that and need that will show up for you. So keep in mind that perfect client is going to be a moving target for you. So what I want to talk about next is when you're working with perfect clients, what can you expect? Well, first of all, they get your value. 
they understand your value. One of the lines I have, I have a perfect client profile. I'm going to share that with you later. Um, one of the lines in mine is that they pay joyfully and on time. The, the checks that are written to you should be written with joy in your client's hearts. They should be so happy to be paying you for the rewards, um, the benefits that you're bringing to them. So the perfect clients pay joyfully and on time. They get your value. They feel that um, they're, they're deeply benefiting from the work that you're doing. And they can almost always explain that value to other people. Um, they respect you as a person, and they also respect your time. So you're going to find that when you work with perfect clients, it's super efficient. The time flies by because you're having a great time. But also, you know, there's not all these kind of like time lags and things in the work. Uh, they value what you do and they pay full price. It's always been very interesting to me, um, this desire to want to give, the more perfect someone is, the desire to want to give them, um, a, you know, a discount or some, some savings or, or, uh, knock something off the price. But perfect clients, they actually value you at your full value. So that's one of the best and most important things is for you to receive from that client your full value and allow them to pay you your full value. Perfect clients tend to be loyal. They tend to return to you again and again, which I think is one of the most um, fulfilling aspects of them. I've had clients who who um, worked with me when they just started out. They went away and did some cool stuff. They came back and now they're at a new level and we get to work together. So we see each other evolving um, in our skills and that's been very gratifying. So your perfect clients will return to you again and again. And best part, they joyfully provide testimonials and referrals to other perfect clients just like them. So when you get uh, testimonials from perfect clients, they're, they're commenting on those things that you most value about yourself. It's like compliments from a friend. Yeah. So they really know you and they really get your value. And that means when they give you a testimonial, it's not just, Hey, I love blah, blah, blah. It's a, a testimonial that really describes, um, and, uh, and serves you and the relationship. You know what I mean? They're very, um, they're very affirming of those things that you want to have affirmed for yourself. So uh, the perfect client relationship, it just kind of gives and gives and gives. It's, um, it's a virtuous cycle um, and it makes a business both profitable and joyful. So it's, there's every reason to be, I, I don't want to say picky because picky makes it sound like, um, you know, you're, uh, uh, it makes it sound small. It minimizes the value of this. I want you to be discerning when you find those clients who, who you should be working with. You should choose carefully who gets this time from you because you don't have a lot of time. These are the ones who are going to get the time from you. So now we've talked about what makes a rotten client and why you shouldn't work with them. We've talked about why uh, you should work with perfect clients and what are the benefits of doing that. And so the next thing I want to talk about is how do you find perfect clients. Well, the interesting thing is the ability to identify them is half the battle in finding them, right? We got to know what we're looking for. And if you can um, uh, identify them for yourself and get a really clear picture of them in your mind, you're going to find that immediately you start to get ideas about where they are. Not only that, if you can describe them effectively, then other people can send referrals to you because they will also know where those clients are. So that's what I want to look at here. The first place that we do this, and it's a little bit of a meditative practice, it comes from um, this wonderful book I read years ago that I'll um, include in the show notes. It's called Attracting Perfect Customers. And it, the exercise begins with you bringing to mind the image of who is the closest that you've had to a perfect client so far. When you, when you think about them, and I have, believe me, I've ever done this uh, process with someone who said, it's, I haven't had one yet. So what I would ask in those situations is have you ever worked with someone maybe outside of your professional capacity who was very receptive? You really want to have a, a, a grounded and specific example of someone that you've worked with who was a perfect fit, like exactly what they needed was exactly what you do. This is really important that the problems that you're being called in to solve for your clients, the solutions they're looking for are exactly like your zone of genius. We really want to make sure that, that it's that kind of a fit. So think about who you've worked with in the past, who was the closest thing to a perfect client. And what were their, their qualities? What was, what's true of them? What were they like? 
So when I do this exercise, I like to write down the name, even just the first name. I'll write down Amy. She was a perfect fit for me. Why? I write down those qualities. Um, Woman-owned business, super love to support her. A mompreneur. She's, um, you know, doing uh, her work. Um, also raising kids, so her business has to serve a very specific role um, for her. Um, smart, creative. Um, what she was not good at was building the business. She was had a, a creative business, so the creative piece she was super brilliant at. What she um, she wasn't not good at it, but it wasn't her her um, her strength. So what she needed from me was help in building the business side. Yay, that's uh, what I'm good at. So that's a great fit there, right? Th that's a part of what made her a perfect client. Super valued me, um, really understood what was uh, what my skills were and my gifts were, could articulate those. Uh, sent me referrals, by the way, to a couple of clients that I adored, um, one of whom sent me to another client whom I adored. So you see how this um, kind of multiplies. So just write down all the qualities of that, of that uh, perfect client that you worked with. And then I like to spend a little time and say, if I were going to make them even more perfect, how would I do that? So I'll kind of polish it up a little bit and add a few more things to my list so that I come up with something where this, um, uh, this is a very, very complete list. And I will write down things in here. Um, they, I already told you one, they pay joyfully and on time. I, I, qualities from my list, because it's a they now, it's not just, um, it's founded and based on Amy, and then since then I've had other perfect clients that I've based it on. Um, I'll write down all of these attributes. Uh, they think big about their businesses. They, um, uh, they're creative, professional, you know, write those things down, write all those aspects down. Um, they refer me to other perfect clients. That's a thing that's in my list. Uh, they implement our the the um, the work that we have come up with. They actually implement it because I know that when my clients implement, they get results, right? So they implement is a quality of a perfect client. And not implementing uh, history of not implementing means that's somebody that I don't want to work with, right? So get yourself clear on these qualities. I've had a. Uh, I've had wonderful examples in doing this exercise over the years. I had one client who said they listened to NPR. That's a description of her perfect client. Um, uh, you know, just all kinds of interesting things can fit in here. Whatever is an, an, uh, an interesting thing. The other thing I would say is if, if there's something that, that is a deal breaker for you, then you want to put this in your list. That's why I list implementing. Um, you know, for others, you know, you may have other uh, things that you want to make sure fit in this list. But for me, if people don't implement, they don't get results and, they, you know, we, nobody wins, right? So that's a, a non-negotiable or a deal breaker that I will make sure to list in my list. Um, the next thing that you want to do is you want to describe them so that a third party would recognize them. Why do I say it this way? Because so often um, people will come to me and they'll say, well, you know, I work with organizations where they're struggling with their culture. And I think, first of all, I don't know, what, where do I find an organization? And then what does it mean to struggle with a culture? Like would somebody, it needs to be something that would come up in conversation. So we want to be specific about organizations. Maybe it's like nonprofit, large nonprofits. That's an organization. Or it can be, um, you know, 10 to $20 million businesses. More specifically, could be 10 to $20 million manufacturers. I, I want that kind of specificity because if you're telling that to me or someone else, you know, how, how would I recognize a referral for you? We would ask. And you're going to say, well, you would uh, recognize it this way. So describe it so that I know what kind of uh, a business or organization that I'm looking for. And then the next piece here is you want to name that problem so that it's not the root cause, it's the symptoms. So if you say that they have a culture problem, I, how would I and how would um, somebody I'm talking to describe a culture problem? Would somebody come to me and say, we have a culture problem? They might, right? But more often, probably what they're going to say is, oh my gosh, we got four generations in the workplace and we're having trouble getting anything done. Or, wow, the manufacturing uh, guys cannot get along with the sales team. Um, and that's stressful. So uh, describe the situation who you're working with and the problems you're solving for them in ways that someone else could recognize that if it came up in conversation. And then the last thing that we want to do, um, the problem and the outcome. 
the outcome that you can get for those problems, that's the thing that I want you to be able to articulate clearly. We'll talk a lot more about that in future episodes, but for now, I just want you to know, um, be, be able to kind of write these things down. If this is a perfect client for you, what's the outcome you're going to be able to get for that perfect client? Now, we've talked about describing these, um, these perfect clients. Being able to identify them that clearly that and describe exactly who they are, it really gets you, you know, 90% of the way, at least halfway towards finding them. Because so often people say to me, well, I don't know where I would find these. I'd love to work with larger clients, but I don't know where I would find them. And I say, well, exactly who are we talking about? And then they start to describe them. And I say, well, you know, that sounds like people that you might meet here or here or here. Um, so that could mean at trade associations, it, obviously it could be at chamber meetings, it could be um, on LinkedIn, but even on LinkedIn, you need to know very specifically who you're looking for. So all of this goes back to the idea that you want to work, per work with perfect clients, you want to uh, know who they are quite specifically so you can locate them, and you need to um, really have conviction and discernment in selecting who you're going to work with and who you're going to turn away. So I hope that has been helpful. Um, I hope it's given you permission to work only with those who can most be benefit, be benefited by your services and not with anybody who shows up. And then in, uh, in times when you feel pressured to take on a client, just know that the times that you um, feel strongly that you shouldn't work with someone and you actually end up do working with them or do end up working with them. Very often I've seen that those are the times that it's the worst. <laughs> you have the worst working experience ever because you went into it with your eyes wide open and knew you shouldn't have done it. Um, I've also seen, and this is a bit of magical thinking, but I have seen over and over and over again that if you turn down the wrong client, which is very difficult, right after them, three really perfect opportunities show up. So I hope this information has been inspiring and helpful. Uh, I would love to hear from you what you'd like to um, learn more about in future episodes. If you have any questions or any pushback, it's all good. And so I would love to hear that. And for today, I'm Samantha Hartley signing off. May uh, all of your business ventures be both profitable and joyful. Thanks for watching. Please like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell to get video updates. Thanks.